Congratulations, you're engaged. The magical wedding you've always dreamed of is now an impending reality. Having perhaps been a bridesmaid or guest at so many weddings, finally it's your chance to have your big day, wear the dress of your dreams, feast on a sumptuous banquet with all your favorite people, and celebrate in the most fabulous location you can think of. You can picture it all now, the horse and carriage whisking you off to the church with well-wishers waving and cheering, peals of bells ringing out and confetti flying. But just before you drift off into a fairy tale fantasy world, you'll at some stage need to come back to Earth and get down to some serious planning. And in all honesty, the sooner the better. First and foremost, a groom is for life, not just a wedding. So really do make sure the man who's just got down on one knee is also the man you'd like to spend the rest of your life with. Also, if you really want your wedding to be memorable for both of you, make sure you include him in the planning, even if at times he doesn't show the enthusiasm for table decorations and seating arrangements that you might have hoped for. It's supposed to be a public declaration of your love for each other, and if you can keep this in mind at all times, whatever the stresses and strains, you won't go far wrong. And of course, with this easy-to-follow guide to help you avoid the pitfalls and experience all the pleasures that a wedding should be, your day will hopefully live up to your expectations and a great deal more besides. You may actually be surprised to discover that traditional weddings as we know them today are a relatively modern invention. The earliest weddings were far from romantic affairs and were invariably driven by politics and survival. In every society, the bigger a tribe or clan was, the better. So in many instances, a prospective groom would kidnap a woman to be his bride from a neighboring village helped by his trusted friends and relatives, represented in modern day ceremonies by the best man and groomsmen. As time moved on, the process fortunately became a great deal more civilized, with people making their marriage vows in church, although it was only with the Marriage Act of 1753 that weddings became a much more formal and legal affair. However, unless either of you happens to be a millionaire celebrity, there's no need to get too bogged down with legalities, as getting the bands read in your chosen church or trusting to your local registrar will be as far as you need to go. However, we're already racing rather ahead of ourselves and probably the most important thing to do before going any further is to decide on a date. This could mean the difference between a wedding with furs and Eskimo boots to one filled with flowing summer dresses, straw hats and the open horse-drawn carriage of your dreams. Summer weddings are incredibly popular, but do remember when choosing your ideal date that this can make hiring venues more expensive. And a winter wedding by candlelight with elegant evening dresses and red wine can actually be just as romantic. Also, don't forget that there's absolutely no guarantee that it won't rain in the summer months, because as many brides and grooms will tell you, the weather is one thing that you can't arrange. Having agonised over a date, you now need to decide on a time for the wedding ceremony. And bear in mind that if you book the ceremony too early, you'll have less valuable time to make yourself look amazing. But make it too late and you'll have less celebration time. Interestingly, according to British law, weddings must take place between 8am and 6pm, a ruling that was established long before electric light became commonplace, so that the bridegroom could be sure the woman stood next to him in the veil was in fact his intended. So you've established your date and the clock's ticking, and there's a growing list of tasks in need of your attention. First of all, where are you going to get married? There's a lot to consider, 
especially if you're an atheist but your groom belongs to the Greek Orthodox Church and has a huge family or banking on you converting. Maybe you've always had your heart set on getting married on a warm white sandy beach, far, far away, or perhaps the prospect of making it short and sweet, tying the knot at the local register office with as little fuss as possible has the greatest appeal. Deciding where to have the wedding ceremony can be a confusing task at times. If you've always dreamt of a traditional church wedding, then you'll need to speak to the vicar at the church where you'd like to get married. But if you'd rather go for something a little less predictable, there are now a huge number of venues throughout the country that are approved for civil services, ranging from magnificent stately homes and romantic castles to tithe barns, hotels and restaurants. The choice can be quite literally mind-blowing. There is just so much to consider, and that white sandy beach in Honolulu might be terribly romantic, but you could find that you won't get many guests able to afford to be with you, and marrying far from home can bring its own risks, from wedding dresses lost at the airport to jet lag. Whatever the location, do check whether children are allowed at the venue, as not all churches and stately homes are as accommodating as others. But don't feel limited by a church or civil ceremony, as there are other options. Some people opt for a pagan wedding, where the marriage vows can be made in the great outdoors and begin with the marking out of a sacred space where the congregation gather in the form of a circle. This is quite different from the traditional sit-down ceremony most of us are familiar with, but weather permitting can be a truly beautiful way to celebrate your special day. And there will be no need for a florist to decorate the venue. Nature on such occasions can be relied upon to do the job for you. The location for both the wedding ceremony and reception will govern the number of people you're able to invite. And with this established, you can then decide on the style of your wedding. Remember, book well in advance for the best prices, and planning a wedding on a budget can be just as good. You can even opt for your local pub for a more casual reception, and you're guaranteed to have just as much fun, if not on occasion more, than at a formal sit-down dinner. And this, of course, brings up the troublesome topic of money and who's actually going to be paying for this great event. Traditionally, the bride's parents would host and pay for everything. But today, things are much less rigid, with more and more couples opting to pay for their own weddings, or at least covering half the costs, while the rest comes in the form of contributions from both families. But whatever you decide, Perhaps the best advice of all is firmly stick to your budget, whether it's 500, 5,000 or 50,000 pounds. Wedding costs can quickly spiral out of control, so be warned. You may also want to think about music at this stage, as this can really set the scene for the wedding of your dreams. From the delightful sound of the harp, to the more dramatic chords of the organ, choosing the right music for you can really enhance the atmosphere of the day. Hand in hand with deciding on your venue, you should also be compiling a list of possible guests. This can be a gruelling task, but just remember not to overdo it. Can you really afford to feed the hundreds that you're proposing to invite? You may want to show your dress off to the world, but should you really class all your work colleagues, or for that matter the local postman, in the category of friends and family? The invitations you send also need to be thought out with care. From the type of calligraphy to the design and colour of the paper, the choice will be vast 
but do shop around, as there are cheaper options to buying bespoke handcrafted cards decorated with all the frills. You can probably find what you need in your local stationery shop, and as long as you've got the date, time and place on the invites, realistically no one is going to remember what colour the paper was. Even when you're trying to keep the costs down, marriage is an expensive affair and you'll find that a staggering 40% of the entire wedding budget tends to be spent on the reception, food and drink. As the cost of the average wedding is estimated at around £15,000, treating your friends and family to dinner and champagne can eat away a large hole in your savings and you want to ensure that it's money well spent. Venues will usually give you plenty of choice from a la carte to more economical options and there are ways you can make your budget spread that little bit further. You could have a buffet instead of a sit-down meal, which will cut down on the number of staff needed for waiting on guests and it's a fabulous way for people to eat and mingle rather than being confined to specific tables. What's more, it can also save you hours and countless headaches pouring over the seating arrangements. But then again, you could always consider a luxury picnic hamper complete with picnic blanket for a more relaxed affair. You can even prepare the food yourself with the help of family and friends for smaller gatherings and burgers and hot dogs can be just as popular as gourmet food. If however you do feel you need to splash out in style, no matter what the cost, Spend time choosing your menu carefully and make sure you check whether any of your guests have any special dietary requirements before giving the venue your final numbers. Be careful not to overdo the drink, as being over generous if you can afford it is great, but can result in embarrassing mishaps on the big day, as even the most model guests can behave very badly after partaking a little too enthusiastically. And next, there's also the most important item on the menu to consider, the wedding cake. This traditionally white tower of glory is key to the wedding festivities and the cake cutting ceremony is a treasured moment not to be missed, which symbolizes the first time the newlyweds break bread together as husband and wife. Way back in ancient times, bread quite literally would be broken over the bride's head. But as this would undoubtedly ruin carefully dressed hair and makeup, it's probably just as well this practice died out in favour of the wedding cakes we know and love today. This is another area where choices can be mind-boggling, with a whole host of decorations and styles to choose from, which sadly in most instances have a horrendous price tag attached. But do remember, there's absolutely no need to have an expensive, multi-tiered extravaganza. You can always make and decorate the cake yourself, or enlist the help of a friend or relation in possession of the appropriate culinary skills. It's not that difficult, and many couples today opt for sponge cake rather than the traditional fruit, and you can always hire tins and stands from cake decorating shops to make life easier. This cake was made by the bride's mother and very simply decorated with ribbon that matched the colour scheme and cost a fraction of the price you'd pay for a professionally made cake. This can add a lovely personal touch as well as helping your budget spread just that little bit further. As you carefully consider what you're going to serve your guests, don't be afraid to ask to try out samples of cakes and dishes but make sure you don't work up too much of an appetite. After all, you want to make sure that you'll be able to fit into that fairy tale wedding dress you've always dreamed of.
For most brides, this is often the most pleasurable part of planning a wedding, because being justified in buying perhaps the most expensive dress of your entire life is a fabulous experience. If you're not sure where to start, try flicking through wedding magazines and cutting out your favourite designs to get a rough idea of different styles. Designers' websites will give you an even bigger range of ideas. But do remember as you gaze at the latest Valentino collection, this is a dress you'll wear just the once and being able to afford the wedding to go with it is also quite a good idea. Before you get too carried away, do try and keep your dress in context with the style you've selected for your wedding and always consider sticking to colours and designs that suit you rather than what's traditionally expected of a bride. Embroidered fabric and beadwork can be popular, helping to flatter the parts of the body you want to draw attention to. Be aware that a huge full-skirted meringue could make you disappear if you're quite small, and a sleek, straighter dress doesn't flatter everyone. You can also have dresses with sleeves for winter weddings, plunging necklines if you want to show off some cleavage, or halter necks for beautiful shoulders. There's even the option of a princess-style train, and years ago, the longer the train, the higher the bride's social status although nowadays they can be a little impractical. The range of styles is endless, and if that isn't enough to think about, you also have to decide on a colour. Don't feel confined to white. In fact, you won't find many people who look their best in pure white, and off-white, ivory or cream will invariably be much kinder. The white wedding dress is actually only a relatively recent idea in the history of weddings, stemming from the tradition set by Queen Victoria in 1840, when she married her beloved Prince Albert in a simple dress of white satin with a wreath of orange blossom representing purity. Before this, dresses were anything but white. Medieval brides wore bright and vibrant colours, with blue becoming very popular as the colour of the veil worn by the Virgin Mary. As a result, blue symbolised fidelity and unconditional love, and brides wearing this colour believed their husbands would always be true to them. Even today, brides will always wear something blue, and a garter is often the preferred choice. But whatever colour you opt for, the best advice is to try on as many dresses as you can until you find the one that flatters your best features and that you'll feel comfortable wearing all day long. And don't forget to consider the time of year. The last thing you want is to be shivering and covered in goose pimples. So if it's a winter wedding, add a wrap or stole, if you'd prefer not to have long sleeves. Now after paying so much attention to the bride, it's about time we considered the groom's outfit which will also determine the dress code for all the male participants in the wedding. Although traditionally the clothes for the groom and groomsmen were chosen by the bride, you'll find nowadays men are much more involved in selecting their outfits. You'll now find quite a range of styles available, and although top hat and tails were once the only option, nowadays anything from a crushed velvet frock coat to a daring white tuxedo will be perfectly acceptable, so long as the bride is consulted first. Waistcoats and neck pieces are great ways to coordinate with the bride or bridesmaids, but if you're hiring the men's outfits, as is usually the case, do make sure you book well in advance to make sure you get the colours and styles you want.
Now, if you're splashing out in style, you'll probably have a host of bridesmaids, flower girls and page boys following you up the aisle. Remember that children can be unpredictable and before you ask 20 friends and relatives to accompany you on your wedding march, consider that you'll also have to find and buy outfits for them to wear. The more bridesmaids you have, the harder finding a dress to suit everyone can be. But if you really can't narrow it down to one or two, a mammoth shopping expedition will be required. Arrange a day put aside in its entirety to tackle the wedding boutiques, high street shops and department stores and find something that suits everyone. The priority will be to find a style and colour that will complement the wedding dress. But avoid too many frills or any style that will make your best friend hate you for the rest of your life. Although it's important to keep the bridesmaids happy, remember not to get bullied into choosing something you don't like. It is your day after all. The bridesmaids actually have an important job to do, helping you to organise the smooth running of the wedding and making sure you look beautiful. But historically, both bridesmaids and groomsmen had another very different function to perform. In ancient times, having accompanied the bride to the wedding to make sure she actually arrived in one piece, their job would have been to help protect her. In many cases, both bridesmaids and groomsmen would dress in a very similar way to the bridal couple as it was believed that this would confuse any evil spirits or even jealous suitors who might attend the wedding. While we're on the subject of traditions and superstitions, one important feature of your wedding you should really start thinking about at this point is the bouquet and flowers. Flowers have been an important part of wedding ceremonies for thousands of years, from the flower garlands worn by the Romans to sprigs of rosemary symbolising faithfulness that friends of the bride would give the groom in Elizabethan times. To our ancestors, a wedding bouquet was much more than a lovely arrangement of flowers. And by the time Queen Victoria wore her orange blossom, the bouquet was seen by many as a collection of carefully coded messages. In general terms, flowers symbolise fertility and healthy children. But it's absolutely fascinating to discover that each individual bloom has its own secret meaning. An idea introduced by the ancient Greeks thousands of years ago. When their language of flowers was later published in the 19th century, the Victorians absolutely adored the concept and lovers began to use this wonderful language secretly to communicate with the giving or wearing of flowers. From orange blossom and bluebells foretelling everlasting love, daisies symbolising a sunny marriage, forget-me-nots for true love, honeysuckle for generosity, white heather for luck, lilies for purity and roses for romance, you can create your own special message within your bouquet. However, if that seems far too much to think about, a good florist will have lots of ideas and help you select the perfect flowers to go with your colour scheme and the style of your dress. Remember your ideal bouquet will help create a sense of balance and harmony in your overall physical appearance. So your most important accessory should highlight and complement the overall effect and shouldn't be overpowering or out of proportion. It's a long-standing tradition that the bride throws her bouquet over her shoulder to the guests after the wedding ceremony. And the person, usually one of the ladies, who catches it will be the next to marry. You might be amused to discover that this seemingly innocent practice stems from a much raunchier tradition that developed in the 14th century 
when the bride would throw her garter to the men of the party. This became rather an ordeal for the bride, as the often drunken rabble would impatiently accost her to take it off, and it was much easier to keep her dignity by throwing flowers instead. Decorating venues with flowers can become a costly affair, so do consider which flowers are in season when you make your choices, as this will really affect the price. Why not use bowls of floating candles with a single flower in the centre to decorate the tables? Or ivy with fairy lights to cover the ceiling? You could even opt for balloons to decorate the reception room, which will really cut costs. So, to recap, you've now chosen the bridegroom, the date, the venue, the dress and the flowers. But there's no time for sitting back and resting on your laurels. Unfortunately, the decision-making is far from over. Unless you're fortunate enough to live a short walk from your local church or the venue of your choice, transport for you in your princess outfit is something that needs to be carefully thought out and booked early on. A horse-drawn carriage may be a really romantic idea, but take into account the fact that it may pour with rain even if you're getting married in the summer. And a vintage car may be a better choice, especially as you can travel at a little more than five miles per hour. An old Rolls Royce or a Bentley can really add to the atmosphere of a wedding, but remember they can be expensive, costing up to £400 for local journeys. Again, don't forget, if you marry out of season or on any other day than a Saturday, the price will come down considerably. Also, make sure the company has a backup, as if the car really is vintage, a breakdown is not an impossibility. Take time to visit the car company you like and make sure you check on the decoration for the vehicle and your backup choice in case there are problems on the day. You could even make a romantic entrance by boat if your wedding is being held near a river or lake. On the other hand, you might want to cut costs and a great idea is to find a friend with a special or unusual car who can be your chauffeur on the day. If you're beginning to feel exhausted after all this planning and preparation, you're just going to have to keep going because we're not even halfway. And to equip you to cope, it's well worth considering the importance of relaxing in the build-up to your big day. Weddings are renowned for being stressful occasions and it really is important that you don't forget to relax amidst the chaos of the preparations. If you notice you're finding it harder to concentrate at work, you can't get to sleep at night, and you're suddenly squabbling rather too often with the man of your dreams. It's warning bells rather than wedding bells that should start to ring. It's easy for things to get on top of you, and many relationships can be pushed to breaking point with the stress and pressure of a marriage on the horizon. So do make sure you take time out to do enjoyable things together. Treat yourselves to a weekend away, a romantic dinner, or simply take the time to go for a walk in the park together. Try to avoid talking about the wedding at every available opportunity. And remember, the reason you're spending every second of your life planning this one day is to declare your undying loyalty and love for one another, and not to put on the show of the century for everyone else. And if it all gets too much, learn to delegate. Friends and relatives are more than happy to help out, so let them. It'll take a lot of stress off your shoulders, 
and make them feel valued as part of your big day. Be warned though, this won't work for everyone and if you're a control freak who simply can't let go of anything, here are some other great ways to make the months leading up to the wedding as stress-free as possible. First and foremost, get plenty of sleep to recharge your batteries after a day of work and organising. Complement this with a weekend of pampering now and again. Having a professional massage to knead away all that built-up tension or a visit to your local spa for some indulgent beauty treatments will certainly do the trick. How about treating yourself to a facial every month to help develop a healthy glowing complexion for your big day? It really is wise not to leave your skincare until a week before your wedding as a facial can encourage breakouts if you haven't had one in a while. It's also important to make the lead up to the wedding as stress-free as possible, as we all know what stress can do to our skin, hair and health. So relax, be lovely and serene, don't take things out on your future spouse and delegate as much as you possibly can. You want to look perfect for those thousands of wedding photos that you'll be sending far and wide, giving no hint of the stress this whole operation has waged on your once wrinkle-free skin. So having got this far, now is the time to concentrate on making yourself look beautiful. There are plenty of beauty salons where you can get a professional makeover, but do book yourself in a few months before the wedding so you've got time to experiment with colours and techniques. When choosing your look, take into consideration the style of your wedding and the time of day you'll be getting married and take photos so you can pick your favourite look. Generally with makeup for a wedding, the idea is to go for a natural look rather than being caked in foundation and shocking colours. Don't forget that your bridegroom fell in love with you he doesn't want to lift your veil to find someone he doesn't even recognise stood beside him. After the makeover, take a note of the products and shades used so you can recreate the look for yourself. Or if you're happy with a stylist, book them to do it on the day. Either way, it's a good idea to try out different colours and tones early on. And most importantly of all, be sure you opt for waterproof and smudge-proof eye makeup so you can happily weep away to your heart's content without having to worry about looking like a panda. The next crucial element in creating a fabulous you for your wedding day is making decisions about your hair. You might want to have highlights or try out a different colour, but just like your makeup, you really need to do this in good time before the wedding so you have a chance to get used to a different look and decide whether it's right for you. You may also want to try having your hair put up, straightened or tonged into ringlets, Again, making sure that you have some photos taken to see if it's the image you're looking for. And if you can afford to get your hair done on the morning of the wedding, this is one less thing you'll have to think about. It's actually a fantastic way to keep yourself calm and takes you away from the hustle and bustle of preparations for that last minute bit of pampering. Because this is one occasion when a bad hair day is just not an option. Do remember though to wear a garment that opens at the front. Anything you have to pull over your head later can spell instant disaster for a put up style.
well as seeking professional advice, there are plenty of things you can do to help yourself look great that will cost next to nothing. Drinking plenty of water and exercising is wonderful for the skin. As well as eating plenty of fruit and vegetables and getting plenty of sleep, especially in the final weeks before the wedding. With all this pampering going on, don't forget to look after your feet, especially if you're having a summer wedding. Treat yourself to a pedicure or even a reflexology session that will benefit your whole body as well as the feet. Hands must also look fabulous to show off that glittering ring and nails need to be perfect. Leading up to the wedding, moisture and file nails regularly and book yourself in for regular manicures if possible. Which brings us very neatly onto the subject of rings. Traditionally, the circular shape of a wedding ring symbolized eternal love and gold represents enduring beauty, purity and strength. What better way to start a new life with your future spouse than by exchanging these symbolic golden bands? Incidentally, the ring is worn on the third finger of the left hand as the ancient Egyptians believed that the vein from this finger ran directly to the heart. As beautifully romantic as considering the rings might be, it's now time for a little light relief as we look at the hen and stag knights, arranged by the maid of honour and the best man respectively, which now tend to be held well in advance of the wedding. Traditionally, hen and stag knights were just that, usually a wild night on the town or simply a get-together for the consumption of copious quantities of alcohol at the local pub. However, today these events can be a much more complicated affair altogether, taking up entire weekends as far afield as Dublin or even Amsterdam. Whatever is chosen for you, remember that L plates and angel wings are considered a prerequisite. And although in the past the bride and groom's parties never met up, this is changing with many couples preferring to have a joint hen and stag night, which can work surprisingly well. You may well need a little recovery time, but there won't be long to get everything else done, and there will now be a lot of questions to be asked, including, have the invitations been sent? They should be dispatched about three months before the wedding with your gift list. So if the answer is no, it's time to start writing. This is one of the few times in your life you're actually allowed to compile a long list of presents for yourself, and it's a wonderful way to start setting up your home together. You can either leave your guests to choose where to buy the gifts from or arrange a list using a specific department store. This is becoming very popular and ordering can generally be done online if your guests prefer. Of course, do make sure you have your thank you cards ready to send out as the gifts arrive. Also by this stage in the proceedings, you should have booked your photographer and if you want an album that truly represents your special day, you'll need to sit down with the photographer and explain what you want. Favourite shots tend to be the bridegroom waiting, the bride's arrival, 
the signing of the register, various groups, the speeches and toasts at the reception, cutting the cake, the first dance, and of course the classic confetti shot. Throwing confetti predates Christian weddings and originates from the ancient pagan rite of showering the happy couple with grain to wish them a fruitful union. Pagans believed the fertility of the seeds would be transferred to the couple and to this day throwing confetti or rice is a popular tradition all around the world. Just one word of warning though, do check with your venue beforehand as many places don't allow the throwing of confetti in which case you may find rose petals or bubbles a better alternative. You may also want your magical moments captured on film, but beware of aspiring movie makers in the family, as if you really want a visually pleasing DVD of the event, it will be better to hire a professional, and if you're having a church wedding, don't forget to check with the vicar to see if filming is allowed. But don't relax too much just yet, as there are still a few last details to consider. Have you organised menus and place cards for the reception? And what about that dreaded seating plan that will have been causing more than its fair share of headaches if you've opted for a formal seated reception? There are some lovely ideas you can use to create place cards with a personalised touch that won't break the bank. How about tying a simple tag around the napkin with a delicate ribbon and a single flower? Or using tags on the stem of each person's glass for an easier option? You may also want to consider favours for the tables. Traditionally used by the French aristocracy, these gestures of thanks for the guests evolved from porcelain boxes of bonbons into bags of sugared almonds, and nowadays all manner of gifts from chocolate hearts to beaded bookmarks can be selected. The cost can add up though, depending on the number of guests, so think carefully about the expense before splashing out. Last but not least, the speeches. Now, although you're not directly responsible for these, as a bride-to-be, you might want to check the contents of the best man speech, renowned for being risque, and your father's just to be on the safe side. Traditionally, the first to speak is the father of the bride, then the groom, and finally the best man. But nowadays, there's no reason why the bride shouldn't speak as well. This is also an important opportunity for the groom to make his thanks to the best man and the guests, to thank both sets of parents and give flowers to the mothers, and of course the perfect moment to compliment the bride. The groom, best man and father of the bride just need to stay calm and do plenty of forward planning and preparation. 
throwing a speech together minutes before they stand up is undoubtedly a recipe for disaster. There's also a well-established wedding etiquette of who should toast whom after their speech. The father of the bride toasts the bride and groom. The groom toasts the bridesmaids. The best man toasts the bride and groom. And if the bride wants to join in, she can toast whomever she likes. Hopefully, if you've been paying attention to this guide, you'll probably have every last detail organised by now. And after months and months of preparation, all you have left to do is enjoy the day itself. The focus really should be on having a good time throughout your entire wedding day. But so many people find it disappears into a chaotic blur as they hurtle from place to place and greet guest after guest without actually registering who they're even speaking to. There is a lot you can do to help avoid this though, and here are a few top tips for making the most of what should be the happiest day of your life. The night before, get to bed early. This really is a must for looking fresh-faced on the day, as well as helping you keep calm and energized. Start the wedding morning as steadily as possible with a soak in the bath and a cup of tea, and for goodness sake, eat breakfast. So many brides skip food in the morning because of nerves or rushing about, and can barely muster a smile for the camera by the time they're on their way to the reception. Take a few moments to contemplate the day ahead. You'll probably need to shut yourself away to do this, but it will help you to focus on what is after all a life-changing event. Once you're dressed, made up and safely at the wedding venue, you'll need to prepare yourself to make a grand entrance. A great tip here is keep breathing. It can be very nerve-wracking walking the long path to the altar if you've opted for a big church wedding, but just keep in your mind that everyone sitting in the congregation is wishing you the very best. And if you can manage a smile at a relative or two, it'll relax you all the more. Remember as well, the man of your dreams is stood there waiting for you. If you get tearful, don't worry, because naturally you'll have taken the precaution of wearing waterproof mascara, as advised earlier. By the time you reach the reception venue, take the time to say a few words to everyone. As you meet and greet the guests, you'll find that being wished well by so many happy smiling faces will calm the nerves and before long you'll be enjoying the fabulous party you've spent the last year organising. It's a good idea not to drink too much, but do save a nice bottle of chilled champagne for when you're finally alone together in the bridal suite, because above all else, you'll need to take the time to share this wonderful day with your partner. A cliche maybe, but this is the first day of the rest of your lives, and you want it to be a perfect beginning that you'll actually remember. And with the honeymoon to look forward to, the best really is yet to come. 
way back at the beginning of this program, we mentioned weddings originating from the custom of kidnapping many centuries ago. Once a bride had been kidnapped, she was considered to be a member of the groom's tribe, but the friends and family of the groom would keep her hidden away until her family stopped looking for her. This period of time evolved into the few weeks after the wedding that we now know as the honeymoon. And if you're wondering, the term honeymoon is believed to come from an old Northern European custom in which newlyweds would, for a month, consume a daily cup of mead, a brew made from honey, thought to encourage fertility. Nowadays, the bride happily runs away with the groom to a dream destination, which can be just about wherever they choose. If you've managed your budget with care, you can splash out on a special honeymoon. And after all the hard work, you'll certainly appreciate being able to relax somewhere romantic. And of course, when you return, your photographs will be ready and waiting to remind you of your perfect day.